This is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus continued, a disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave to be like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret will There is nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my father in heaven. Do not think I have come to bring peace to the the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father and daughter against her mother and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the gospel of the Lord. There was a couple, and they had two sons. And they were concerned about the boys because one was an inveterate optimist, and the other was a dark pessimist. And they were so concerned, they went to a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist said, gee, that could be a real problem, but I think I have a solution. He said, let's get two rooms and fill one room with all sorts of wonderful toys, all the toys that a child could hope for or imagine. And then he said, I've got a friend who owns a racing stable. We can get what they clean out of the stable and put that in the second room. And then here's what we'll do. We'll give the pessimist, we'll give him that first room full of toys and it will show him that there are good things in life. And we'll put the other boy in the room with the produce of the stable, and after he sees what his brother has, he'll realize that things aren't always rosy. So the parents said, well, we'll try it. And so they do. They they give the, the pessimistic child a room full of beautiful toys, and they put the other child in the room full of the output of the stable. And then they wait. And some time goes by, and then they go and check and see how their experiment is going. They go into the first room, and they see the little boy with all the toys. He's sitting on the floor. He's crying. They say, what's wrong? He says, I know somebody's going to come and take these away from me. And then they go to the second room, and they see their other son sitting on top of that mound of stuff. And he's taking clumps of it and throwing it behind him. He said, what are you doing? He said, I know there's a pony in here somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus in the gospel is in 
in, in the middle of his missionary discourse. He's trying to tell his disciples who he's sending on mission. He's trying to tell them what to expect and what to be on guard for. And he doesn't want them to be optimists because he realizes that this will not be a cakewalk, but he doesn't want them to be pessimists either because he also knows that there is no reason to be afraid. And there's no reason to be afraid because God loves them and is with them and will always be with them. And so he starts off this, it's actually the third segment of the missionary discourse. And he said, he says, it's not enough. No servant is above his master. It's not enough for students to be like their teachers. Servants and servants, it, pardon me, it is enough for his students to be like their teachers and servants to be like their masters. What he's saying is, this, these are your marching orders. And it sounds deceptively easy, but it is actually incredibly hard. He is saying, be like me. Our job in the world is to be Christ-like. And that isn't a one day a week for an hour a day period. He wants us to be Christ-like every day of our lives, every moment of those days. So what is it like to be like him? Well, one thing is, let's look at his mission. His mission is to reveal the face of God to the world, to reveal the character of God to the world. And what is that character? God is love. He wants us to be in the world loving even the unlovable. And that is a hard mission in today's world where there is so much division and anger and hatred. And Jesus is saying to us, rise above it. Love the people who don't love you. Pray for the people who don't love you. And teach the world what God is like by your loving hearts. But the other thing Jesus came to do is he came to speak God's truth into a dark world. And so he asks us, too, to speak the truth when the truth is hard to speak, when the truth is dangerous to speak, when you might be canceled for speaking it. You know, in, in the 30s, in Germany, three quarters of the churches failed to speak out against the evils of Nazism. What would the 20th century have been like if early enough more people had spoken up and said, this guy is evil, don't follow him? So we don't get off the hook. We have to engage our world, and we have to engage our world with God's truth. The world would tell you there is no truth. There's just a bunch of narratives. And the, and the strongest narrative wins. But that's a lie. There is truth. It's rooted in God. And we know it. There's truth found in this book, and we can find it. And so Jesus is saying, do not betray me by caving in to the cheap, tawdry, easy values of the world, because the world rewards folks that cave into it. But we are asked to speak the truth into that world. And sometimes the truth will make us unpopular. So Jesus is saying, it's not going to be easy. Because they call me Beelzebub. They, call, they say that I'm evil. And they'll do the same to you. You see, if we're really living our Christian vocations, we should be causing a bit of a stir in the world, don't you think? 
because the world's values stink. But if we just go along to get along and keep our faith calm and tame in our churches, we are doing nothing for the people out there who are being lost. And so Jesus says, speak the truth when it's hard to speak it. Take risks for the gospel. And when you do that, they will say terrible things about you. They will call you names. And he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because everything that is hidden will be revealed. Because the truth will ultimately win out. Coventry Patmore, a, a late Victorian poet, wrote a poem, and part of it went, for want of me, the world's course will not fail. When all its work is done, the lie will rot. The truth is great and will prevail when none care whether it prevail or not. When all its work is done, do not be afraid of the, Lord, of the world's lies. Because after they're finished doing their work, their tawdry work, they will rot. And we'll be vindicated if we stand for the gospel. If we stand for our Christ. There'll be a price to be paid. But Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because the truth will ultimately win. The truth will be told. People will know it. He says, don't be afraid because... because those in power can harm your bodies, but that's all they can do. They can't take your immortal life from you, the life that God gives, the life that will never end, the life that is meant to be spent with, with the Lord himself in the kingdom of heaven. Don't worry about what happens here and what they can do. You know, how, Christianity is one of the most persecuted, if not the most persecuted, religion in the world right now. Hundreds of thousands of our brothers and sisters in China, in India, in Pakistan, throughout the Middle East, are being, in, in Africa, are being brutalized just because they follow Christ. Killed just because they own a book like this. And we are their brothers and sisters. One of the truths we can say is we can use our freedom of speech to speak to the world and say it must stop because we don't hear about it on the news, do we? We don't hear about it because it's not popular. And we're not popular. But Jesus says, don't be afraid. There'll be pushback. I mean, he doesn't want us to be optimists. He doesn't want us to be... He wants us to be realistic. He wants us to know that there is a price to be paid for our commitment. Bob Zimmerman was a young man. Well, he's born, he's not a young man anymore. He's born in 41. And he grew up, he was a child of the 60s. He got into the pop culture. He started writing music. He was very well received. You probably know some of the protest songs he wrote in the 60s. Um, he was a friend of John Lennon. He was a friend of... of uh, uh, Arlo and Woody Guthrie. Uh, and then he was a Jewish kid. He was born in Duluth, Minnesota. Orthodox Jewish parents, or grandparents from Russia. Bar Mitzvah, the whole nine yards. And then in 1978, he embraced Christ as his Lord and Savior. What happened to him? Well, some of his fans protested hey, you're not supposed to be giving us Jesus. You're supposed to be helping us protest. His friend John Lennon turned against him. John Lennon wrote a song about him. And his, his agents and, and, and the, the, the press, they also turned against this man who was one of the most popular songwriters of his age. In fact, he's, he's alleged, or I've read that he was one of the most influential songwriters of the 20th century. He changed his name in 1961 from, from uh, Bob Zimmerman to 
Robert Dillon, Bob Dillon. But he withstood the pressure because he had faith in his Christ. And he had faith in the one who said, do not be afraid. And ultimately, um, ultimately, we have a wonderful brother in this, in this great talent who had the courage to speak Christ into not only the world, but into his music. One of the Christian songs that he wrote was Slow Train. Slow Train? Is that, is that right? Slow Train Coming, is it? Yeah. Um, so what is Jesus asking us of us in this passage? Because it's, just, it's not just written for his disciples he's sending off on mission. It's written for all disciples of every age, and that's us. He is asking us to passionately live as Christians in the world without compromise and without apology. I, and I think there are two dangers. One danger is ideology. And, and we have to avoid thinking that, that the ideology that we are closest to is always in line with the gospel, because it isn't. Jesus and his gospel and his message rise above every ideology. But we also have to beware of rationalization. What I think must be what God thinks. No, we need to be prayerful. We need to be in the scripture. We need to learn because the, the, the word disciple means student. And as students of Christ, we are to learn what it is like to be like Christ, and then we are to implement that lifestyle. He knows that's difficult. He says, pick up your cross and follow me. But if you try to save your life in this world, if you grasp on all the things that the world says are valuable, you are following a fool's mission, and ultimately you lose. But if you let go of the world and its glitter and its, its temptations and follow him, then you will know a life that is astoundingly beautiful. I had a friend, Gene Walsh, he, he was a Catholic priest. He died um, on his way back from Australia. He had been giving a conference in Australia. He was coming back to Washington. And he died in a swimming pool in Hawaii. Well, being, he was a liturgist, and he, he left different funerals for the circumstances of his death. Well, this was, these were happy circumstances, but, happy circumstances, but he had a prayer card printed with his face, its picture on it. And on it was written, Jesus promises a meaningful existence and eternal life. If you get a better deal, take it. And he wrote that because there is no better deal. But it's a difficult challenge. It is not easy. But God is with us every step of the way, telling us on the more difficult days, do not be afraid. Amen.